Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, glad that you've all made it and everything worked. This is our first, hopefully, uh, first uh, of, a, of a regular set of remote training that we're going to uh, be putting on for our Greek members. Um, just a couple of uh, things to go through at the beginning. I think everybody has already picked this up, but if we could keep the microphones on mute, please. Uh, the only reason is, of course, it, it can uh, detract from the person that's speaking uh, at that time. Um, and also, uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to ask. You can use the chat function. So there's a little speech bubble on the screen. You could type those in there. Uh, Kelly is keeping her eye on those questions. If we don't get to your question, uh, I apologise, obviously we've got a, a little bit of a set time, but what we will do is we will um, take them all away and we will get them answered. And if you think of any questions after the fact, then my email is at the end of the presentation and you can email those to me. And we will compile these questions, uh, obviously anonymously, and uh, we will make an FAQs so that they will be there for, for you every time you want to, to look. Um, just to let you know, we are recording this so that we can send it to the people uh, like yourselves and those that missed it. Um, and um, we have sent some slides out to you, which are numbered. So if you're having trouble seeing the slides on the screen, uh, please feel free to follow those and I'll try my best to remember to reference the slide number. Quickly, what we're going to be looking at, uh, obviously, clue is in the title. Um, we're going to be seeing uh, what the issue is. Can we prove that there is an issue? I'd like to think so. What are the common problems? The commonest problems that we see on, on the soya bean trade. We're going to be having a look at the causation, uh, both uh, from a practical and scientific point of view. And then we're going to look at prevention as well. Some of these are, are quite uh, sort of almost basic prevention tips uh, in the gathering of evidence uh, and such things as that. As you all know now, you've been involved in this for many years. There is no magic bullet that will just make this all go away. But hopefully, if we could follow some of the sort of uh, evidence gathering and basic prevention tips, we could at least assist the uh, claims handlers and the insurance teams in uh, in, in in handling the claims as they arise. Well, we are very lucky uh, that we have a guest speaker today, someone who really knows what they're talking about so that you don't have to listen to me drone on as per usual. We've got Dr. Stephanie Hurd here from CWA International. She's part of the food science team and we work very closely with uh, Stephanie and the CWA team. They're always very helpful uh, from initial quick advices to uh, full blown instructions. She works very closely with us and we're very pleased to have her on board to help the membership out. Um, so Stephanie will be coming in to add the, the clever elements of the presentation. Um, and and uh, so that will be more on the science side of things for you guys. Uh, the North team is myself. Some of you will have met me, some not so much yet. Claire Andrews is here, Deputy Director of Claims, and Angelina is joining us as well. And should any of you decide to throw us a curveball and ask us a uh, FD&D related question, we have uh, the Deputy Director uh, from the Greek office uh, for FD&D, uh, Gillian, with us as well. Um, so we're very lucky. Hopefully Claire and Angelina will join in and help the uh, the insurance teams that are listening in at the moment uh, uh, with uh, any questions that they have related to more the P&I side of things and, and I'll look after the, the ops guys. Uh, so soya beans, where and what? OK, so on slide 10 there we can see the main trades, not exhaustive. Um, uh, America, we do see a fair bit coming out of uh, America, but I think the main uh, thing that we all really need to focus on, given uh, given the subject matter, is the Brazil to China uh, trade. Uh, like I said, we do see quite a bit of soybeans coming out of America, but uh, we see less problems uh, with that particular trade than we do the Brazil to China. So I'll hand over to Stephanie, who will tell us why that is. Why do we see more problems between Brazil and China than we do between any other uh, trades? Stephanie. OK, thanks, John. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, you're all very familiar with the um, Brazil to China soybean trade. Um, and as John said, a lot comes out of the US as well. 
um, but we see a lot, a lot more claims and a lot more problems with cargo deterioration uh, related to the Brazilian soybean cargos. And this is really down to the differences between the two um, agricultural systems. They're very different. So the US have well-established farmlands um, and along with their uh, sort of uh, long established farmlands, the infrastructure is 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 very built up um, and the uh, transport systems are very established. So getting the beans uh, down from th the growing areas to the terminals, um, it's uh, it, it's uh, well established and uh, we see less problems in beans being stored for a long period of time. Um, and also they have a lot more sort of drying facilities um, close to, to their growing, growing farmlands. If we look at Brazil's um, agricultural system, it's completely different. Um, you will have seen probably recently um, in the news that um, you know, deforestation is quite a big thing in Brazil and a lot of the deforestation and expansion in the Cerrado areas is, is down to farmlands expanding. Um, but the infrastructure, um, predominantly sort of roads which take the soya beans from the farmlands down to the, the ocean ter ocean going terminals, um, that, that this transport system hasn't really kept up with the expanding or and very quick rate of expansion for these growing regions. So if the infrastructure isn't supporting this, what tends to happen is, is we get um, longer delays when trucks are taking soybeans from the large, the um, uh, very isolated growing regions down to the terminals. We get delays on trucks. Um, we also get um, bad weather, which might mean that the roads become uh, clogged up with mud and, and the trucks can't get down. Um, there's also the added element that a lot of the um, soya beans which are shipped from the northern art ports are actually barged um, to uh, terminals at Santa Rema and Bacarena. So um, we also see that um, soybeans can be kept on barges for long periods of time. So really, um, I would say the transportation time is much uh, is prolonged in Brazil. And so therefore, once it gets onto the vessel, um, they the, the beans themselves may not be um, as uh, fit for for carriage uh, in comparison to the US. So um, it, it's really down to the infrastructure and, and if the infrastructure within Brazil itself can can keep up with the expanding farmlands and, and you can have more storage facilities and drying facilities, then you would probably see a reduction in, in the problems to the cargo uh, when it gets to, to China. Um, and then the second most important sort of uh, difference um, or, or element which leads to, to confusion over the, the quality of the cargo is also the difference in standards between Brazil and China. So every country will have their own standard um, which their, their, their grain or their soya bean needs to adhere to. And Brazil and China standards, um, they're, they're, they're different. So what, what if, a, if a cargo of soybean conforms to the Brazilian standard, it might not actually conform to the Chinese standard. And therefore, when there's an argument um, as to whether the, the cargo has deteriorated or not in China, you're often looking at the Chinese standard, um, which makes uh, the, the, the claim a lot more difficult to deal with. So, so those are the main, main two um, sort of regions, reasons why we're seeing the, the, these problems in Brazil uh, with Brazilian soybeans in China. Me, if, if I may just uh, step in before we move on to the next slide, um, that, that reference actually to the different uh, standards is a very uh, good point. And I'll just briefly refer to a claim I recently had where unfortunately we've had to put up a security for 2.9 million USD, and it's not the only one, where the ship was really not at fault. So the vessel loaded in Brazil soya beans, which were clearly on spec according to the Brazilian standards and according to the sale contract as well. And when the vessel arrived in China, we did receive that security request, which has unfortunately developed into uh, court proceedings in China against the carrier for about 1.5 million USD. And um, at the same time, the receivers have also raised a claim against the sellers under the uh, sale contract, which provided for phosphor arbitration. Um, 
And what what we did on this one, and it's a, it's a strategy that we uh, we've started considering more and more lately, um, is that uh, we have charterers involved to the uh, to this problem as soon as possible. Uh, so on this occasion, the ICA was incorporated, for example, and ICA securities have been exchanged. But we didn't just then sit back and wait until we settle and then um, chase charters. Instead, we had them involved um, earlier. Um, charters were Glencore, and we were pleased to see them involved to this effort of a commercial uh, solution. So what we did was we suggested an early intervention on behalf of all charters to the receivers. And that wasn't really that wasn't really easy for charters to understand or accept, which is why they counter proposed a uh, Chinese mediation. Um, we're looking into it. That would be another alternative. Um, it's and I thought it's just worth mentioning um, exactly because um, the very standards per country, uh, particularly in Brazil and China, can really bring members into a difficult position where they really shouldn't be. Thanks. Thank you, Angelina. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Um, moving on to, uh, is there an issue? These are some statistics that I put together. It refers to uh, grain uh, claims as opposed to specifically soya bean, but you can see this uh, shows that uh, out of all of our claims in North from the end of the 2019 policy year for the previous five years, that for grain, 27% of those claims by number was for damage and actually 34% for shortage. However, when we move on to the cost of those claims, we can see that damage accounts for a quite staggering 70% of all grain claims that North had. And I can tell you from experience and speaking to Claire and the P&I team, a large number of that 70% is related directly to the Brazil-China trade in, in cost. So you can see that they are there is a costly issue out there with this with this problem. The main types of damage that we see, whilst not exhaustive, but the main ones are listed there. Um, so we've got heat, uh, as in uh, hot surfaces such as fuel tanks, engine room, hold lighting, things like that. We've got the mold and self-heating, and those two uh, with the first and that second one can go a little bit hand in hand. Recently, we've had a couple of infestation ones, but still not as common, thankfully. Hold cleaning, uh, wet damage, shore damage and shortage. However, with regard to the Brazil-China trade, the main ones that we'll focus on here are these three, because we could talk about this pretty much all day if you wanted to, but if we just concentrate on the main ones for the Brazil-China trade, uh, so that is heat, which is often uh, or can be uh, the fault of the, of the vessel, the mold or self-heating, which often isn't the fault of the vessel, and wet damage as well. Uh, so they're the three that we're going to focus on a little bit uh, through through this. So I'm going to ask uh, Stephanie now uh, again to tell us, she's going to run us through a little bit, uh, some photographs of those three elements, why it occurs and what it does to the cargo. So uh, a little bit of a scientific background, if you like, to those three problems. Uh, so Stephanie, do you want to uh, just let me know when you want to change pictures and, and you go ahead. OK, thanks, John. So um, soya beans are oil seeds and they're different to grains like uh, wheat or corn because they have a high oil content. And this means that uh, soya beans are liable to uh, self heat um, if they are provided with the right conditions. So um, they self heat because firstly, there, there are two mechanisms. One is uh, the moisture content might be um, uh, the moisture content might and the temperature might be just right to allow mold to grow. And as mold grows, um, the temperature of the bean will increase. And when it gets to a certain temperature, what happens is the oil starts to break down. Alternatively, if there is a hot heat source in, con in close association with the, with the soya bean, then that heat will also result in the breakdown of the oil. And as that process occurs, um, you get um, additional heating and, and then self-heating is, is uh, initiated. So um, a lot of the times you might you might you might you might see um, soya beans which are 
uh, kept uh, in or in close association with heated fuel oil tanks and um, the heat transfer from the tank surface to the soybeans will uh, directly cause uh, the heating beans to heat. But what it will also do is drive moisture from a warm area to a cool area. And as that moisture is driven down that gradient, you also get mold growth as well because the water in certain parts of the soybean cargo gets mouldy. So if I can have the next slide, please, John. Great. Actually, so, Stephanie, if I could just jump in there, I've got a, a, a useful example there of, um, of a case I dealt with recently on, um, on soybeans suffering from heat damage when um, vessels were burning fuel, not burning fuel directly from the storage tank, um, the the fuel transfers through a series of processes such as settling tanks finally to a service tank from where the fuel was consumed and I think the point here is that the fuel had to be heated on this particular voyage that uh, the member had in order to reach the required viscosity so that they could actually use the fuel so then a claim arose exactly the circumstances that you've just arrived from heat damage and um, it was fairly clear that we had to settle it, that members had to consider settlement with the receivers. That's what happened. But then we went full on um, against charters. And, and I noticed a message there from one of our members asking about how we how they ensure their interests are fully protected. And on that particular case, we had very good um, fuel temperature records. We had excellent support from the members technical department explaining to me and, and to loss prevention exactly what had happened on that particular voyage and they were bunkers that charterers had put on board so therefore we managed to obtain a 50% um, contribution under the interclub agreement towards the final claim okay it wasn't 100% but these are difficult claims and I can say it's often very challenging to get any contribution from charters in that situation but that was a, a good example of where we we're all able to work together um, at, and charters uh, conceded that actually they had had a part to play as well. So thanks for that. Yep, thanks Claire. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I uh, I think it's it's really important to, I'm sure we'll touch on, on this a bit later, but it's really important to ensure that any sort of heat sources which are in close association with the beans, they are are monitored and, and, and kept to as minimal as, as possible really. Um, so just jumping back to um, when I discussed about sort of um, the self-heating process. Um, as, as I mentioned, sort of the, uh, the journey of the soybean in Brazil, uh, the, the, the beans can be exposed to environmental factors such as rain or leaky barges, things like that. Or alternatively, um, they may not be dried down to uh, a low moisture content. And so if, if these beans are at a, a certain moisture content and, and it's quite warm, what you'll happen, what will happen is you, you'll get the mold starting to grow, um, and then as as the oil um, it starts to break down, you get this change in colour. So um, if if during the voyage, if, if the if there's any additional de delay, portions of soya beans which are at a higher um, than desirable moisture content will start to um, uh, visibly deteriorate as the as the colour continues to darken. Now, just because you have some beans, so, so sort of you, the beans at the beginning are obviously sort of creamy and yellow. Um, most receivers would, would consider those very sound. But if you get sort of areas of light heating, sort of where the beans start to discolor, sort of the, the third, fourth, and even fifth bean, even it, at those colors, those, those beans are still um, very useful and, and can be used in processing. So it's only really when we get um, to the very sort of charcoal um, black beans where the oil has been completely uh, broken down and, and completely deteriorated that it becomes a, a, is a problem for processing. Um, okay, next slide, please. Great. So this this is a really um, uh, great picture of, of of showing where how pockets of cargo have been loaded with uh, different types of moisture content. So these sort of really dark beans that you see in the central part of the picture, that that portion of cargo has been loaded with um, a high moisture content and it's really started to heat over time. 
and um, the heat has sort of radiated to areas around the cargo um, and that's initiated heating as well uh, in ad adjacent beans which weren't necessarily at a, at a very high moisture content. Um, you also get a, a crusted layer on the surface where we get moisture being driven upwards um, and then that creates uh, areas at the surface which have a higher moisture content and then we get additional mould growth. So these sort of patches of, of caked and um, blackened areas are really sort of classic um, evidence uh, that the cargo has been uh, loaded with a high moisture content. Of course, in this case, there's also been a heavy delay. So um, soybeans aren't really uh, the cargo itself. It, it can't be stored forever on a ship because um, it doesn't have through hold ventilation. So um, really, you can't, you know, leaving beans on on a, on a bulk carrier for multiple months is, is not ideal. Um, but this really just illustrates that portions can be loaded at, at various moisture contents. And as a result, if, it, if they are allowed to, to self-heat for a long period of time, you're going to get this real discoloration. OK, thanks, John. All right, so um, uh, we also see um, that you might find uh, darker beans mixed in with uh, creamier beans within the bulk of a stove. And this tends to indicate that you've had um, soya beans perhaps sitting in a storage facility for a long period of time um, at the, the low port side. Um, and they've decided to just mix in, in a blend of new and um, older or older soy, older soy, uh, soy beans, sorry. So um, then what would happen is that you might actually not have the self-heating on board necessarily, but when the cargo arrives, the receiver can see that there's a lot of blackened beans mixed in within the stow. Um, and in that case, um, it's still probably likely, depending on the quantity or the percentage of really black beans, that the cargo can still be blended for soya bean oil and soybean meal um, production. Um, but the blending ratio might have to be a lot higher with a with a visibly sound cargo. OK, thanks. Right, this is um, a very classic um, photograph which indicates that there has been uh, ship sweat or condensation forming um, which has dripped uh, down from the uh, underneath of the hatch covers in this very um, classic grid like uh, pattern and in the areas where the moisture has dripped you get a dark mold growth occurring. Now this tend to happen, tends to happen when you take a warmer cargo um, loaded in a hot climate and you move the vessel through cooler climes. Uh, the warm air from uh, the cargo uh, will rise and then condense onto the cooled steelwork around. Um, and we see this a lot um, generally where vessels have, have uh, been delayed in, in cooler climates and that's led to this classic condensation. So um, uh, I'm sure we'll discuss this later, but this is really when uh, ventilation practice comes into play um, and also discussing with the receiver. So just because the surface uh, looks like this, a lot of receivers may think the rest of the cargo is like this. But actually, uh, if you skim the surface, that layer is probably about 10 centimetres thick. It can be skimmed and the cargo underneath, providing there's no um, other uh, self heating issues going down deeper in the stow, then you'll find that uh, once that surface cargo is segregated, the rest of the cargo can be used as intended. OK, thanks, John. Stephanie, is that an operation the crew can undertake themselves, that skimming of the 10 centimetres? How practical would that be, do you think? Um, I mean, if uh, yeah, it is quite practical. But I guess it depends whether the vessel is geared um, or not. But uh, a lot of the time we've had uh, at various ports, we've had um, crews or stevedore assistants in hand segregating um, that type of cargo. So uh, when you use a grab and you try and uh, skim just the top 10 centimetres, there's going to be a lot of admixture with sound cargo beneath. Yeah. Um, so in that case, you might want to um, push for a more of a hand segregation um, technique to reduce um, the quantity, the quantum of damage. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it is something that the, you know, the crew and working with additional stevedores could could um, easily, easily perform. Okay. OK, and uh, again, this is sort of the um, 
but this is kind of highlighting more that perhaps the heating it is it could also be related to um, uh, self heating within the stove. So uh, there's been a grab fall which has been taken from the centre there, and um, they've started to see that perhaps there is uh, further evidence of self heating in the bulk of the cargo, uh, which means that this might not just be related to ventilation. There could be um, the combination of of heat coming from the cargo, um, the hot air then. Uh, hitting the cooler steelwork and then uh, forming condensation uh, damage at the surface of the stove. So there you've got the combined effect of the self-heating cargo, which then leads to uh, condensation damage and ship sweat. OK, thank you, John. We also get moisture migration um, within the bulk of the stove. Um, so here the steelwork has, has cooled down and we've had moisture migration moving from uh, the warmer part of the cargo and out into the cooler part by the steelwork. And then at, at the steelwork where the moisture content has been displaced and increases, we then get mould growth growing in that region and caking. Again, this is something that's just affecting the smaller portions of cargo at the periphery. It's not really going to have a, a major effect on the bulk of the stow in, in the centre of the cargo hold. So it's this could be also very easily um, cleaned away and segregated. Thanks, John. Uh, I think that's not, I think, uh, should we go to the next slide? Yeah, perfect, thank you. So um, this is a classic sign of uh, water ingress through um, hatch covers. Um, generally, if, if water is able to um, enter the hold, it will take the path of least resistance, so it will move down, uh, down uh, a portion of cargo. And in the, the areas of beans where um, the water has come into contact, that, that's where mould will grow. And so you'll get this pillar of caked cargo, um, which, which is mouldy on the inside and starts to heat and goes black. Um, but the, the pillar itself is, is um, generally, you can remove this with hand segregation or with the assistance of a grab. Um, and uh, again, this is a very localised damage. It can be removed without any effect on the rest of the cargo. OK, thanks. Thanks, John. OK. OK, yeah, thanks very much, Stephanie. It's excellent. So <clears throat> we have talked a little bit about the causes and what that does to the cargo. Interesting to hear about some sort of uh, Ways that you can actually save quite a lot of that cargo if if you're uh, if if you're early enough to get people like uh, Stephanie involved to to help with those kind of suggestions. Um, and like I said before, there is no uh, sort of silver bullet uh, to to this as such. Uh, however, there are things that we can do to try and protect ourselves. And I see, as Claire said, one of the one of the members has asked that already. And that's what we're kind of move on to here uh, with myself and Stephanie and. Uh, Angelina and Claire going to have a quick look at some of the things that we advise and how they help in the process of handling the claims or preventing and handling the claims. OK, so the heat prevention starting off with um, the more basic side of it, the sort of uh, the, the most common one being sort of fuel tanks, uh, hold lighting, uh, sometimes engine room bulkheads, things like that. Um, uh, the most predominant one that we see is is fuel tanks uh, and heating the fuel uh, inside the, st the storage tanks on either side of the hold. Um, we've actually recently seen a, a little bit of an uptick in this problem since the advent of some of the VLSFO uh, fuels require slightly more heating. So one of the things we're trying to push at the moment, which is difficult and we appreciate that, is, is a greater uh, focus on uh, the fuel management on board um, where possible, waiting for the results back on these new fuels to see how much you're going to have to heat them and uh, considering whether that will have any effects on the cargo uh, that is adjacent to those fuel tanks and the holds. So um, that's worth bearing in mind if you're if you're using these new fuels now due to the 2020 requirements. The other things that we see uh, as a problem here is quite often down to basic maintenance. Things like your steam system and the gauges and instrumentation that tells you the uh, temperature in those tanks are sometimes a little bit of a forgotten 
uh, the forgotten item of kit. Uh, we should definitely stay on top of those uh, to prevent overheating of the fuel and to make sure we can read accurately what those fuel measurements are. And, and Claire alluded to this uh, a little bit earlier. Record keeping has been a little bit lax on some of the claims that we've seen um, uh, for fuel tank. Uh, temperatures absolutely must be spot on. If there's any element, uh, any party that thinks that this is going to have something to do with it, that will be almost the first question that they ask is what what temperature were the tanks running at for the duration of the voyage? And so again, we get back to that sort of evidence collecting um, section of it, uh, that if our accurate records, we can answer these questions uh, much more easily. I think, Claire, you've uh, already touched on uh, record keeping uh, in this already. Yeah, um, John, it it's, it's always seems to come back to the evidence when you're trying to defend the claims for members. Um, and even if it's a fishing trip by cargo receivers or charterers, it's such an easy gain for them to try and attack poor records, even though actually um, that might just be a complete red herring and nothing to do with the cause of the claim itself. So it, it's easy said, isn't it, to ensure records are accurately kept. But there are so many records to keep on board a ship. Um, and, I, and I think it's a very easy target for charterers and receivers to have a go at. But if if and when we get really good records, as I did in that case I mentioned earlier, it's it's sort of like a dream ticket to mounting a really good um, uh, management of the case where it's possible. Yeah, I mean, uh, 100%. And, and uh, we talk a lot about different trades and the problems on those trades. Uh, realistically, I like to try and, and think to get the, the crews make this part of their sort of day to day thing, not just oh, we better keep good records now because we're operating between Brazil and China. If, if we can instill that that's a day to day running and these records are excellent all the time, then they're just there at the, at the push of a button, if you like, then that's a massive bonus. But that is one thing that we see that immediately questions start being asked of is, is record keeping. And the first one on this slide, I would say, would be your fuel tank temperatures maintained for the entire voyage. Uh, and also, um, if you're getting your fuels tested, as I said earlier, try and keep a record of, of uh, when you get those test results back, when you started burning the fuel. Uh, Stephanie, have you got anything to add on uh, fuel management? No, uh, that everything you've, you've kind of covered with the, the fuel records, um, just, you know, keeping temperatures as, 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 as low as possible, but still being able uh, to keep the fuel pumpable, is, it tends to be our sort of mantra. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, think, I think that's 100% uh, correct. Um, so again, straight in there, record keeping and evidence uh, claims team like to get that. It just makes uh, life a little bit easier with the claim handling. In, in general, we're having going to be start having a bit of a drive on. I mentioned the steam system and the instrumentation plan maintenance systems. It's also really good form of evidence if it has been maintained properly, not just a list of dates when jobs were done, but a little bit of extra information is a good job description in there, how long the job took, man hours, what you did, what you found. It makes a good record and, and plan maintenance systems can make an excellent form of evidence uh, if they're used to their uh, absolute maximum uh, capabilities. So the mold and self-heating thing, we've, we've gone from something a little bit there. However, you know, I suppose that as, as well as the heat from the tanks uh, directly uh, affecting the, the cargo directly on the bulkhead it can sort of lead into this section which al although it uh, can be driven by engine room temperatures things like that it can also as, as stephanie's outlined in the causes uh, be very much uh, something that the vessel has uh, absolutely no control over and this is uh, where where the problems sort of arise for the ship's master who is not uh, a doctor uh, like uh, stephanie or so it's a difficult one and again, it starts to come down to uh, asking questions and recording that you've asked those questions. So uh, something we very commonly see, and I'm sure uh, the claims handlers and Stephanie have seen it as well, is when they tell you the moisture content uh, in Brazil, you get this max 14%, uh, almost uh, like a post-it note chucked at you, which as we know, best practice is to get actual uh, good uh, lab results. You're not gonna get those uh, in our experience in Brazil. Even if you ask for them, you're probably not going to get them. Uh, but you have to ask and you have to record that you've asked is, is what we're trying to say. Um, and uh, we don't think that realistically they're going to change the way they operate. But we 
uh, advise that you ask and if you don't get them then then we'll we'll make a protest on that uh, stephanie is that a fair comment yeah absolutely um the more information you can get about the the cargo quality uh the better but as you said you're you're not really going to be able to get that so um i you know i don't know if you're going to expand on this next but um collecting evidence during loading um, is always a good uh, indicator or, or just sort of a preventative document that you you could ask a local surveyor to come on board and take temperatures all throughout loading. So every few hundred or thousand tons which is loaded, um, they could take the temperatures on the barges or on the trucks that are arriving. Um, possibly if there's a break in loading and it's safe, they could go into the hold to take temperatures as well. Um, and uh, a lot of the surveyors also have their own moisture meters, um, so they could take in situ moisture uh, measurements during loading as well. They won't be 100% accurate, but it will give you an idea about whether um, we, whether if there is a claim later on down the line, it gives you some sort of evidence to show what was uh, the temperature and the moisture of the cargo at loading, because that's usually the information which takes the longest to get uh, during these claims. Um, and um, also, uh, I would also recommend taking as many photographs as well as possible of, of the loading uh, procedure in itself. Uh, you might not realise that this photo of of um, a truck that you happen to take was actually uh, evidenced of a wet truck or something like that, which showed that they were they they weren't covering the truck in raining or something like that. Could be really important later down the line uh, if a portion of wet cargo is is found in the hold. Um, and I think Claire, you also mentioned, uh, or you possibly going to discuss about you know if it's really dusty when loading mm. for example um making sure that uh you just take a picture of that of of the fact that it is really dusty so your crew couldn't actually see what the cargo looked at yeah i was uh, amazed to deal with a large soybean damage claim recently um and when we carried out some investigations what had happened at the low port that there wasn't a surveyor attending on that occasion, but it was quite clear from speaking to, to the crew and the master that there had been so much dust, the cargo, the soybeans are being loaded by pipe. So what you can actually see is, is very limited. And then they pour into the hold and there's just clouds of dust to the point that I queried actually whether it would even be safe for crew to, to, to be around in that environment because it was so, so dusty, but you certainly couldn't see the condition of the cargo at all. Um, and, and it did occur to me at the time, well, actually, if we just had this this type of um, procedure being recorded, it, it's like a picture tells a thousand words, doesn't it? Um, and in China, where the Chinese courts are taking this very forensic approach in their lovely courtroom as to what was happening at the low port and why don't we have more evidence that we say the cargo was X, Y and Z? Well, it was impossible to get that evidence. Um, so then you're relying then on your samples and your certification. And, and as John's already said, um, that that is problematic as well. So so even just proving um, a negative, we couldn't get more evidence because this was the condition at the low port. These were the this was the temperature. This was the weather or this is the loading by pipe. All of that to build up that jigsaw um, is really useful and, and is very helpful in the, with the explaining and persuading the Chinese courts that uh, really the master had done everything possible. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Uh, videos, photos are some of the best forms of evidence because it, it might not mean very much to, to me or you, but if you put it in front of someone like Stephanie, it might mean uh, that little bit more. And I think that extends to sampling as well. We discussed this with uh, several members over time that it can be quite difficult for the crew to take those samples, which is why often in Brazil, given the level of problems that we have, um, really it's very uh, good really to get sort of some kind of local assistance uh, in general to help the master and certainly in, in getting samples of the cargo uh, to be retained. Yeah, I think to add to that point about samples, um, uh, it's, it's very important that samples are taken in a representative manner. Um, if samples are just taken, just one sample from one hold, um, that won't be enough to uh, provide an indication of the cargo quality as a whole. 
um, it's 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 better if a, a methodology is is followed and and that we usually for soya beans would follow a phosphor method of sampling um, and that and that the crew would not be able to follow that kind of intensive sampling regime so they would need local assistance um, from uh, from a company if they if if they thought there was a problem and and, and samples needed to be taken it, it would need to be done in that manner to assist yeah. yeah. Excellent. And um, just one last thing, really, that can help the master. They should be doing it anyway, but the surveyors may be able to help is, of course, the cargo temperature on loading, which is, is uh, critically important, uh, given uh, one of the causes that Stephanie outlined was the moisture content and temperature and the fact that we can practically use that temperature throughout the voyage uh, to, again, uh, for ventilation records. So cargo temperature on loading is extremely important as well. Absolutely. Um, there is a question in there, Stefanos, I have seen it. Uh, is there a commonly acceptable temperature limit that one can maintain in the tanks adjacent to the cargo holds that can guarantee that you will not be experiencing any problems? I don't think there's a, a rule of thumb, Stephanie, but I'm willing to... Uh... Yeah, I mean, it really depends. Um, I think our sort of uh, oil and chems uh, department would, would kind of say, look at the pore point of the oil and then maybe 10 to 15 degrees above that pore point once you've had your fuel oil analysis undertaken that that's kind of the temperature you should be looking at when we see records where you know the, the fuel is carried above 40 degrees it's it's a real risk because this is a you know such a heat sensitive degree um cargo but i would really be looking at what the pore point of, the, of your fuel is before making that decision excellent uh, which is why going back to us earlier I know it's difficult sometimes, but trying to get the test results back prior to using uh, any fuel, uh, obviously, would uh, the test would give you that pore point a lot more accurately. Yeah, 40 degrees was the temperature mentioned in in the case I dealt with, um, and there it was. They, it, the expert I spoke to said, well, you expect the fuel to be transferred bit by bit from the storage tank into the service tanks from where it's consumed. So it's it's heated up to get that mm. pull point, to get that usability. Um, but even that, even 40 degrees and certainly over 40 degrees, I think that's your your red flag area, isn't it, where you're starting to be concerned what, what might be happening with the cargo on the other side. It's uh, definitely all about a lot more about fuel management, given the the, the, the types of fuels have expanded so much as well uh, recently. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, in summary, really, uh, for the the self heating, we do recommend that you try and get some help, if not just for the master, the master himself. Uh, try and get the appearance, if that's possible, through dust. If not, get loads of photos and videos. Try and get some samples cargo temperature and if they're giving you paperwork that just says 14 percent max or, or something like that ask the question if they still don't give it to you which is most likely uh, raise an lop over that matter and just say look i asked and they couldn't give it to me um so we're trying to cover ourselves for problems later on that may or may not arise um okay wet damage prevention uh, which is uh quite commonly sort of hatch lids uh, probably out of the, th the three most common being hatch lids, bilges and tank lids inside the holds. But I would say that hatch lids was the most common uh, from, from a ship point of view. And then, of course, there's a ship sweat as well. So we'll start with ship sweat, actually, because we touched on ventilation earlier and the importance of taking the cargo temperature on loading. North's loss prevention department always tries to push the three degree rule for any hygroscopic cargoes such as soya beans. Um, we think it's A, safer, and B, easier, uh, and therefore it will be done more effectively by the crew. Um, if we ask, and it's very common, whether it's wet damage, whether it's self-heating, uh, one of the first things it's asked for is the ventilation records. And if we are sent the dew point rule uh, set of those, then we do start asking questions about how did you get into the holds and get an accurate dew point from inside the holds? Uh, so it's a much easier, much more believable piece of paperwork if we go with the three degree rule um, and it's simpler for the crew. And again, like the fuel tank uh, temperature records, good ventilation records, good believable ventilation records are the key uh, here for the claims handlers. Um, Stephanie, do you want to talk about the three degree rule and ventilation a little bit? 
Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's definitely uh, by far a lot more practical than uh, the dew point rule. It just relies on uh, cargo loading temperatures uh, being taken for each hold. And then as the vessel sails, all the crew have to look at each watch is the ambient temperature. And if that ambient dry temperature drops three degrees or more below that cargo temperature from loading, then they should be undertaking ventilation. So that, that means they don't have to go out onto deck and be taking measurements through any, any pipes into the hold or anything like that. They're just reliant on those um, load port temperatures. They don't, they don't have to do any additional cargo monitoring. Um, so it does make it a lot easier. But I, again, I'd also like to stress the ventilation records, making making sure that you are able to to or the crew are able to write why they haven't ventilated as well as why they have um, yes. really will assist uh, assist the case. So ensuring that they say, you know, we're following the three degree rule on these rec uh, on our record. Um, we haven't ventilated because of the weather or um, uh, because of fumigation or, or those reasons. And then again, uh, the periods of time when they have ventilated as well for each hold. So, well, so that makes it a lot easier to look through. While we're on that, uh, why we're not ventilating, I'd just like to very quickly touch on the question of not ventilating at night, not ventilating in fog and not ventilating it in the rain. Um, it's uh, a divisive uh, sort of question about whether you ventilate at night particularly. Um, for safety's sake, some people say they won't do it because they don't like sending crew out at night, which is a fine reason. Uh, what I would say is that if that is the reason, I would back it up by saying what the weather forecast, what the conditions were going to be. Were you expecting that the crew were going to have to go out because a it was going to start raining or the weather was bad or the weather was going to be picking up etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, because that's often a question uh, that's thrown at us as well by the other side is well why did they stop it was night time uh, you know if it's flat calm and you're expected to stay flat calm then you have to start weighing up um, whether it's actually better for the cargo to ventilate uh, given the risk is low of any poor weather or rain um, uh, Stephanie, uh, have you got any strong feelings on uh, nighttime ventilation or fog? Well, a lot of the time, nighttime is when you're more likely to get ship sweat because the temperatures uh, do cool down. And if you are sailing with a warm cargo into China in the winter, for example, if you're sailing up to Dalian or something and the, and the steelwork is cooling down, then at nighttime, when it gets even colder, that's when you're more likely to get condensation. So uh, actually at night time, sometimes it can be more crucial that uh, ventilation is undertaken. Um, I've got a couple of questions just to oh, go on, Claire, sorry. No, nope, I was just going to pick up on the questions you've already spotted. Okay, yeah, um, just ops two, I'm not quite sure who that is, but uh, how much is the maximum moisture content uh, that we may accept for, for the soya bean cargoes? Uh, can the moisture content affect the quantity of the cargo. We face an issue where we have loaded with much moisture and in the end we had a shortage. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not a scientist, I'll leave this to Stephanie, but we, we often uh, I don't see that, that you could lose enough. I don't know. Yeah, um, so a lot of the uh, uh, sort of contracts for soya beans, they, they are at 14% moisture content. You can, you know, contractually load a cargo at. But actually, we find cargoes coming from Brazil because it's sort of in the high twen 20s. Um, mold, mold growth and self-heating is not just about the moisture content. It's also about the temperature of the cargo. So uh, even if you might have a, a slightly lower moisture content, but a warmer environment, you might still get moisture content because, uh, sorry, mold growth, because these two factors affect something called the equilibrium relative humidity of the cargo. And we say that if the cargo is around 70%, then it's it's likely, if the ERH is at 70%, it's likely that you'll get mold growth in that cargo, and then that will lead to self-heating. So in Brazil, if you've got temperatures sort of up to 30 degrees or higher, and you're loading cargoes, which are above 13% moisture content, then it's it's likely that you might be be getting self-heating during the voyage. So and, and that means that if there's any delay during that voyage, you're going to have um, 
you're going to have problems with yeah. self-heating. And, and this is very difficult because Brazil is, uh, you know, a lot of the time around the year, you know, it is very hot. And, and that's why sort of this 14% moisture content is just, it, it's, it's way too high to be sending a soybean cargo all the way to China. Maybe if it was going to, on a shorter voyage, um, it would be acceptable and you wouldn't get the, the heating to such, the degree, such a degree. But, you know, cargoes that we've seen high 20s, you know, getting really above 13.5%, then we're really looking like proper self-heating in that cargo. So I ideally, I would want that cargo to be shipped below 13%. But th th this is where there's a bit of a, an issue with, on the contract side, because the, the contract will always say 14%. Yeah, and, that, and that's reflected in that document we referred to earlier, where they write max Yes. Uh, Fourteen percent moisture. Yeah. Knowing full well that that's uh, in the contract as well. There's another interesting question from Stefanos with regard to ventilation, and it's something that we come across, or in my experience, more out of America than Brazil. But it's an interesting question anyway. What happens when the ventilation is restricted by fumigation for the entire voyage? Should the master ventilate as per the three degree rule, or respect the instructions of the fumigation company? We in loss prevention actually wrote. Uh, an article on this exact thing, Stefanos, alongside uh, Stephanie, because Claire had uh, several of these uh, problems. And uh, it turns yeah. out it was more a US problem where the, some US uh, guidelines said that this should try to uh, not try to keep the ventilation closed for the entire voyage. Uh, the only thing I can say, practically speaking, if I was master on there, is I would ask the charters for that in writing, as it's usually their responsibility to organise the fumigation and the fumigation company. Uh, we carried out some inquiries in the States on this with correspondents did, yeah. and lawyers over there, and they said that these contracts, which just had a standard clause in them, charter parties, said fumigate for the length of the voyage. And these were when voyages used to be between seven and 14 days, so we're entirely consistent with the fumigation period. However, once people started carrying cargo all the way from the States right to China, which is within the past few years, as I understand it, um, and they weren't changing the charter parties to, to specify the period for fumigation, just still leaving them with for the duration of the voyage, then they were getting 40 days fumigation. And, and it's a good question because yes, obviously fumigating for that period, uh, Steph Stephanie will know better than, than me, it is a problem and in in unnecessary, Stephanie, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is no, the, the, the sort of length of fumigation, when it says the whole length of voyage, it, it, it was originally designed for much shorter voyages, maybe a week or something like that. Um, but actually, your fumigation period doesn't really, usually, if the dose is correct, it doesn't need to be longer than 10 days. Um, so, but but in, yeah, as, as you mentioned, like in that instance, you can go back to the fumigator, go back to the, the charter, a question why you need to have that fumigation period um, that long as well, because they the, the crew are obliged to follow the fumigation instructions. Yeah, just get it in writing. Uh, yeah. that, that's what they want to do. Uh, just... Go on, it's a good example just to pick up on, on, on George's point earlier about what can we do to protect members' interests if we identify those kind of clauses um, and it's going to be a long voyage, we can take that up and try and nip it in the bud um, and, and agree with charters that the fumigation will just take <clears throat> place for the required period. Um, just snipping back to the question about moisture content. When you're talking about the hygroscopic cargo giving off the moisture or with the air there, uh, I think the question is, can you um, actually lose so much weight you could end up with a shortage? Um, I, not really in not really in my experience because if if you think about it, the moisture the moisture is not actually leaving the hold, it's condensing. And then it's dripping back onto the cargo, so uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to get a huge, you know, loss loss in actual weight of cargo. Yeah, it was a bit of a misnomer with the bag rice trade as well. I think it was yeah. a few briefings that you could uh, get sort of a shortage claim because of the uh, reaction with the air with the hygroscopic cargo, but uh, we've not really seen that being a much of a problem. Uh, and there's another question about ventilation, which is also entirely true, that it doesn't really affect more than 10 to 50 centimetres of the cargo. Yeah. Uh, true, but the records still need maintaining. It's, it's about proof again, you know. Yeah. If, if you do find damage down to the, you know, the tank top, then 
it's clear that you know it's not a ventilation issue it's a self heating self heating issue and if you have a a bulk cargo that is you know massively self heating any amount of ventilation will not cool that cargo in the center of the stove but the crew just have to demonstrate that they have still undertaken the necessary cargo care um and and ventilated uh, as well as as they could during that voyage yeah um and stefanos has come back on us asking the charteries about the the uh, instructions to keep yeah i imagine it is a difficult question um <clears throat> if that's the case and, and they're having trouble i mean we're, we're always on the hotline uh, stefanos uh, anybody in north or stephanie herself would uh, no doubt help you out with something to say to to charterers in that in that case i, I understand that it's uh, the charterers are quite often not the most helpful for you they're not and we can certainly help out there john have quite often have spats with charters and sometimes even say to members you know ask them to call us direct and and sometimes they do i've had contact from from glencore direct on all sorts of issues where they start off in a completely unreasonable position but then i think they start to realize well the member and the master is trying to solve this problem and um and the club is advising and giving guidance which is completely reasonable and then also if you can get the charterers club involved they will see the reasonableness of it because everybody knows how the science works here so bit by bit we, we try to move towards a, a solution but i agree for the for the, the master to try and do that on his own is is, is very challenging if not impossible i think with a lot of these cases if, if you think there's something wrong or you're having problems like that then you're more than likely correct and uh, yeah. just pick up the phone to us and uh, we'll try and help out with with giving you some backup on that yeah if a, if a car from a cargo claims perspective is a problems identified at the low port that is invariably the best time to try and deal with it and however challenging that might prove to be and we'll, we'll come back to rita's question earlier about about off hire off hire and that and charter party clauses but you know good examples are where it's rain during loading it wasn't possible to close the hatches some cargo might have been wetted um you know discharging that cargo may well be the right course of action and that's going to cause huge problems when when the pressure is to just keep loading um, and and that is a very good example where many times we, we've helped um, trying to avoid LOIs other workarounds commercial pressure from charters letters of protest you know if if a cargo needs to come off or samples need to be taken a cargo needs to be looked at further all of those however challenging they they're the right thing because otherwise we're just bottling this problem for a bigger problem in China where where our experience is showing it's it's really hard to try and to deal with these things. Sure. Do you want to have a crack at? Sorry, Rita, I, I didn't see yours pop up there. I, uh, my apologies, Claire. That looks <laughs> like it's got your name written all over it. Uh, or possibly is yeah. Gillian there? Is Gillian there. Gillian. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, Rita is asking. Have you seen the question? Yeah, I yeah. mean, the problem is that these uh, higher and uh, that would be a time charter. It's all very fact specific um, in terms of, you know, what you you're not going to be off hire if you're doing something which is reasonable in the context of a cargo claim, generally speaking. Um, it, it, so it really has to be a specific advice on the particular charter party um it's for charterers you know to show that the vessel is off hire um you're not obliged to expose yourself unreasonably to claims in order to get your hire you're still entitled to your hire if you're acting reasonably and um you know potentially protecting charterers as well because that cargo claim is possibly going to come back on them as well um there is a, has actually been uh you know a recent case um on a voyage charter actually the eternal bliss uh, which makes it clear that you know where there's a cargo claim owners and that's as i say it's a voyage charter but they're not limited to um claiming demurrage for loss of time but also you know can potentially claim against charterers for the consequences of a cargo claim. So it is very specific on the particular charter party, but there is protection there. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Gillian. Um, so just finishing up on the wet damage, uh, we've done a lot of ventilation there, which is again, back to record keeping and evidence. Um, the other things, of course, I said is hatch covers, uh, a good plan maintenance system, as we've mentioned already in this session, uh, to make sure there's plenty of photographs uh, of good quality hatch rubbers, etc. And if you can do your own hose tests and things like that, um, then then you, then we can uh, then we can use that as evidence later to say, look, the hatch covers are okay. Bilges again in your plan maintenance, the return uh, non-return valve, the check valve, and the bilge systems. Can we please keep uh, plan maintenance up to date on that was checked it's very common that we get the back flooding on the bilges and slightly less common is, is the tank lids uh, often that is because the bosun is left on his own after a tank inspection to put the lid back on he doesn't do the most sterling job in the world and then when the tank is pressed up with ballast water again next time round, uh, in comes the uh, the ballast water but certainly the most common problem uh, uh, to prove is the ventilation. So we should try uh, where possible with hygroscopic cargoes such as soybeans to use that three degree rule. Um, has anybody else got anything to add there from the panel? I was going to mention a few points on strategies which we've got on a few cargo soybean claims at the moment and um, just things that are, are in the pipeline that we're trying um, again looking at that theme of what you can do to protect your interests and and I think what we're trying to do in PNI is become more aggressive in how we handle some of these claims um, because they are very challenging. I've got one at the moment um, uh, for, for one of our Greek members where we've got a cargo receivers have commenced proceedings in China and we've applied to um, join the shippers, uh, Bungie, large big shippers of soybeans, to those proceedings in China. The relevant point there being that Bungie have an office in Shanghai, so they have a presence in China. Um, else you might say, well, there's no jurisdiction against Bungie. And indeed, I'm also looking down in Brazil at commencing proceedings against them in Brazil. But given that we already have the proceedings against the owner in China, and I think China's really where it's all going to get determined, and I favour China, I think, as a jurisdiction over Brazil. That, my general view. I think it would be good if we can try and deflect some of the attention away from owners. We haven't been granted those third party proceedings yet by the Chinese court. They're still thinking about it. One of the interesting aspects on that case as well is that cargo came into China and customs impounded it. Um, and customs can do this if as and when they wish to. I don't think there's any rule of thumb as to when they will, but they did on that occasion. And the interesting point being they carried out an investigation. So again, in the Chinese courts, we've made an application for the results of that investigation because customs demanded that cargo receivers and shippers Bungie attend their premises in China and explain themselves basically as to what was the condition of that particular cargo. I thought that was quite interesting, that evidence I feel sure would support the owner's position that it was a pre-shipment problem on that occasion. So that's another application which is pending. I think if we get the information from customs, we may then get them joined as third parties. And then, as I say, we're also looking at proceedings down in, in Brazil as well. And the balance here is you have to keep the time bars all in check so that um, you don't become time barred in Brazil if you're looking at what your options might be in China. Um, and again, we don't want to throw wasted costs at any of this. We need to know that some of these options Options are actually going to to take us somewhere strategically. Um, so, but that's just to throw out some stuff there that we're we're trying. We're trying to be more aggressive with the defence of soybean claims um, from a strategic legal point as well. Thanks, Claire. Excellent. Uh, so, the last slide there. Just don't worry about giving us a ring, as I've said already. If you think there's a problem, there's probably a good chance there there is. Um, so give us a ring or Stephanie uh, is more than helpful as I said at the beginning we have a very close working relationship with Stephanie and CWA and I'm sure she'll be happy to uh, take a call off any of you. Yeah, absolutely and just to finish on some good news Rita's comments there John. Uh, to give sort of a long time to manage to receive almost full compensation from charterers both for club claim and legal costs club to club dialogue eventually helped and commercial settlement was agreed.
Excellent. Thank you, yep. Rita. Good I think we know the case. I think we know the case you're talking about there, Rita. And in, indeed, it was, it was was another good example of where members and club were able to work together, and, and charters eventually were brought to the table. That that, and I agree that has to be the way forwards. Excellent. Um, so, if we didn't get to any questions, or you think of some later on. That's no problem. There's my email address, john.southam at nepia.com. If you send them to me and they're far too scientific and clever, I will pass them on to Stephanie, who will no doubt give us a, an extremely good answer, and I will make sure that they all get back to you should you have any further questions. If you want any of our publications or anything like that, or to speak to Stephanie, you'll find all those details online as well. So uh, thank you, Stephanie, for, for everything today. It's been very interesting for all of us. Thank you. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you, John. And, and that's all I have. If there's no more questions, please feel free to send questions later. But that was uh, excellent. Thank you very much for attending our first one. And hopefully, if you have any ideas for subjects that are troubling you greatly, then let us know and we will try and do something on those subjects for you in the future.